thank you very much for coming uh, to the World Economic Forum on Africa. Uh, and this is a press conference on the launch of the Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Report. Uh, I have an excellent panel with me today. Um, so we're going to be talking for the next half an hour, I think, on, um, on this report, which is very, very data rich. Um, I have some experts with me. Um, we'll talk for about, um, we'll, uh, I'll let our speakers have some remarks for about 15 minutes and then we'll go to some question and questions and answers at the end. Um, the session's also uh, live streamed and um, we're tweeting out under the hashtag uh, AF19. So um, uh, on my immediate left, um, I have um, Ade Funke um, Adeyemi, um, and she's the Regional Director for Advocacy and Strategic Relations for the uh, International Air Transport Association based in Switzerland. Um, Mr. Didier Dogley, who's joining us from the Seychelles, he's the Minister of Tourism and Culture. Thank you very much for coming. And I have the um, uh, Honourable Dimitri, Dimitrios um, Marana, uh, Marantis, who's the Senior Vice President and Global Head of uh, Government Engagement at Visa, and one of the co-authors of the report from the World Economic Forum, uh, Lauren, Uplink, um, Lauren Uppink. Uh, and I'm actually going to go first to um, Lauren Upping, who's going to give a brief overview of the report um, and, uh, and highlight some of the key, the key data points and findings. Thank you. Yeah, great. So the Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Report is published biennially, and we've been publishing it now for over 10 years. Um, this year we saw the same trends that we're seeing, um, that we've been seeing for the last three years, that travel and tourism is booming. Um, the growth continues at a rapid pace. We note that we saw 1.4 billion arrivals in international arrivals in 2018, which is two years um, ahead of, of anticipated uh, timelines. So the anticipation of 1.8 billion by 2030 is really um, maybe too conservative. Um, we also see that tourism exports um, have a, a growth rate that's higher than merchandise exports, so 4% uh, versus 3%. And so we really, it's a, it's a really exciting sector and it's got enormous potential to um, drive economic growth. The, the report itself measures the set of factors and policies that um, promote sustainable development of the sector, which in turn contributes to competitiveness and economic growth in a country. Um, this year we ranked 140 countries and the, the leading spot went to Spain. Uh, for, this is now the third year in the row that Spain tops our competitiveness report for travel and tourism. Um, and just a, a quick sense of who uh, was in the top 10 is actually the same order as last year, except that the USA bumped the UK out of the top five. So we've got Spain, France, then Germany, Japan, and the USA in the top five, followed by United Kingdom, Australia, Italy, Canada, and Switzerland. Um, but what we're really seeing, and, and this is really the... the the emerging trends beyond this rapid pace of growth is that um, there may be a tipping point that we're approaching. And this is not just for mature economies. Europe, once again, was the top performing region, but it's also still continues to grow, even though it's a very mature economy for travel and tourism. And infrastructure and capacity um, constraints exist, but we see that for emerging economies too, where not infrastructure, it wouldn't be infrastructure and capacity constraints, but actually gaps in infrastructure and tourist services. Um, and we see the opportunity in some of those more nascent or emerging economies to really utilize travel and tourism to um, promote economic development. Um, but they have the opportunity now to avoid maybe some of the, the bottlenecking and overcrowding that we're seeing in some more um, mature economies. Um, maybe just to some top-level facts, the top, 10, the top 10 actually account for a third of international arrivals, and the top 25% of countries of those 140 account for over two-thirds of arrivals in um, international aviation. Um, and in Africa specifically, we have, a, um, we have the areas where we see the greatest need is in connectivity, and that's air transport connectivity, ICT and, and international openness. Um, but we also see great potential. So uh, Africa, the Sub-Saharan Africa actually saw the greatest growth in visa uh, international openness. And 10 of the top 20 countries for improved visa openness was, was uh, on the African continent. So we're seeing some of the policies that are being de uh, developed across the continent really proving valuable. And um, so we see the opportunity really for 
for sub-Saharan Africa um, as the second, actually has the second highest growth rate for, it predicted to have the second highest growth rate in travel and tourism, um, GDP and, and arrivals over the next 10 years. So it's a really exciting time. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, Vubke, can we, can we go to you next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lauren and the team for inviting me. Um, for Africa, I, we believe that seamless connectivity is a critical element of development and socioeconomic growth. And Africa is a continent that, in terms of its land mass and sheer size, air transport is the logical short to medium term solution for moving um, people and goods around. Um, unfortunately, in Africa, a lot of governments across the region see air transport as a elite means of transportation for the rich. But if you consider that last year, aviation carried 4.4 billion passengers globally, that seems to me like mass transportation. And in Africa, it can do the same. Unfortunately, only 100 million people are flying by air in Africa today, out of 1.2 billion. Now, why is this important? Well, connectivity, as I said, is really crucial to aiding Africa's development and really transporting us from where we are to where we need to be as a, as a continent. And the African Union recognizes this um, because it has made three key projects and initiatives the flagship for its Agenda 2063. The first one is the single African air transport market. Uh, the second is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was launched um, a few weeks ago. And the third is the Free Movement Protocol on Movement of People and Goods. Now, these three recognize the importance of connectivity as a driver for socioeconomic development. Now, the engines of these initiatives are transportation, infrastructure, and services. And air transportation, as I said, is really crucial in this space. For too long, African governments have focused on the development of alternative uh, means of transportation. And while we need an integrated transport system, road and rail, we don't have um, you know, a, a railway from Cape Town to Cairo today, neither do we have a highway that traverses the continent. So in the short to medium term, we really need to start you know, getting African governments, policy makers and decision makers and the international partners to start to see aviation as a crucial leapfrogging technology for Africa. Now, the single African air transport market was launched in January 2018 um, by African heads of state under the leadership of Paul Kagame at the African Union last year. And since then, 28 African states have signed up. Out of those 28 states, um, they represent about 80% of intra-African traffic, which is significant. Um, and since then, what we've been trying to do is to really facilitate the implementation of that initiative. So what does it mean in practice? Well, the idea is that for the SATAM to work, Africa should be a domestic aviation market, meaning it should be easy for any African to be able to move from city to city by air without too many restrictions in terms of air services and in terms of visas, and to be able to move their goods as well in terms of custom um, um, regimes. And so that's what this whole all translates to. And when you think about the promise and the potential of the African um, trade agreement, which is expected to really increase intra-African trade by a significant amount in the short term, and this is really fundamental for us to be able to see. Next steps on the SATAM, on the single African air transport market, is for these 28 states to begin to open their, their services to each other. And let me give a practical example. About 10 years ago, when Ghana and Nigeria opened their skies to each other, um, we started to see some interesting things happen. People could go for meetings, leave Lagos in the morning, go for a meeting in Accra, spend the day and come back the same day. What that led to is that businesses in Nigeria and Ghana started to open up branches and firms in that place. And it leads to economic development, leads to investment, certainty in doing business, and all of these kinds of wonderful things. And what we found is that if these 28 states are able to open up their markets to each other, it would significantly reduce travel costs because then you have more air services and more um, competition and therefore more value for, for passengers. And you can reduce it by up to about 20 to 25% in terms of cost. Today, the cost of travel in Africa is 45% higher than anywhere else in the rest of the world. So that in itself is a disincentive for people to take this leapfrogging technology as a means of transport. 
The other thing is that it can reduce the travel times by as much as 35 to 40 percent. Now, I, I've got to tell you my route back. So I flew in on, from Lagos to Johannesburg and Johannesburg to Cape Town. Relatively easy, seamless. On my way back, because the flights are so full, I'm going first from Cape Town to Durban, spend seven and a half hours in Durban Airport, then go to, back to Joburg, then from Joburg to Lome before I get back to Lagos. It's ridiculous on the same continent. Now, of course, it's, it's a huge continent, we know that, but that is what the SATAM is designed to address, to really close those connectivity <laughs> gaps. And that's really fundamental and important for us. Finally, as an industry, we're trying to um, work on practical, um, creative ways to help governments across Africa really fast track the SATA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, Seychelles is a, is a leading tourism economy. Um, uh, so perhaps, uh, Didier, you could, you could give some of your, your perspective, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, Seychelles, as you said, we are a country that depends highly on tourism. Um, about 67% of our GDP indirectly and directly stems from tourism. And uh, we've been uh, investing in the infrastructure and also the policies and the services required by tourists for the last 40 years or so. Um, if you take um, the report and look at some of the main elements or dimensions that they've been measuring, um, if we look at the issue of connectivity and um, as far as Seychelles is concerned, it's very easy to access Seychelles from, from Europe, Africa, and also um, Asia. We've got about 15 airlines that service Seychelles, and there are about 80 flights a week. So if you can't get into Seychelles in the morning, you can get in the afternoon or even in the evening. So it's very easy and seamlessly, um, either through direct flights or via the, um, um, the Gulf um, Airlines. Um, by making a stop either in Qatar, in Abu Dhabi, or in Dubai, or in um, um, one of those areas, then um, even at this, you can stop to and get into Seychelles very easily. So that's the first thing. The second one is um, openness. Um, visa, to get a visa to Seychelles, you basically get a visa upon arrival for all countries. Um, but you need to meet only three conditions. You need to have a booking in a hotel, you need to have a return ticket, and you need to show that you have proof that you have the necessary means for you to finance yourself during the time you are, you are there. So it's very easy to, to get in and, and for you to have your holidays and that. And I think Seychelles is number one on the issue of openness as far as visa is concerned. Um, the third one is about um, safety. Seychelles is a very safe place compared to many places in the world. You might get your opportunistic theft of something that somebody might have left um, somewhere lying around. But otherwise, in general, it's a very safe place. You can walk wherever you want in the evening, at night, during the day. So, so there's very few problems as far as safety is concerned. Sustainability is one area where we place a lot of emphasis because the islands are very small. We've done um, um, uh, the um, carrying capacity studies for the three main islands, and currently we're doing We've started another process of doing it again um, to test um, you know, the carrying capacity of the different islands that are normally visited um, by tourists. And um, in 2015, we decided to put a moratorium on the building of large hotels in the country, um, partly for tourism. One is um, to promote the smaller guest houses so that um, we have more inclusivity, more people involved in the tourism industry because there are people in Seychelles that has the capacity to invest and at the same time um, uh, to make sure that we measure exactly what is it that we, um, that we want because we didn't want just to keep on building large hotels and then at the end of the day we have overcapacity and this is not something that we would like to see. But at the same time there is this conundrum of, you know, of having 2,000 seats on planes coming into Seychelles every day and then at the same time, you need to have enough rooms for you to be able to supply, to keep that supply going, because otherwise the planes will disappear if you cannot grow. So currently, we we're looking at all that to make sure that um, these figures um, uh, do match each other and that there is some growth and also meet um, the areas, especially in the four-star and upper three-star, where there are more demand for tourists to come. 
Um, in general, we've had a growth of about 5% um, annually during the last five years. And this year, we are at 7%. And again, it's about um, making sure that we don't go over the tipping point, but making sure that um, the tourists that come to Seychelles, they have really the best um, experience that they can have in the country. So I'll stop here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and we can possibly sort of have, uh, have Q&A at, the, um, at yeah. the end as well. Um, uh, uh, Dimitrios Mar um, uh, Marantis, um, your perspective from, uh, from Visa, please. So hi, everyone. I'm Dimitrios Marantis from Visa. I don't know who to thank first, whether it's Lauren <laughs> and Wef for producing yet another great report chock full of insights or the minister um, next to me. I spent my honeymoon in May in the Seychelles um, and just loved it. Um, so I work at Visa, and um, Visa, as you all know, is um, you know, one of our missions in life is to make it as easy, as safe, as secure, and as seamless as possible for travelers to pay for their international experiences. And we see a lot. Um, uh, in terms of travel and trends that are happening around the world. And I wanted to share just four quick insights with you. The first is competitiveness. Um, you know, Lauren, you mentioned this earlier. Travel fuels um, economic growth. It doesn't just fuel global economic growth, but it fuels economic growth in local communities that are attracting tourists. Um, and the runway in Africa is just incredible. Um, in 2018, Africa only consisted of 3% of gross travel receipts um, internationally. And you just see the opportunity that there is here. Um, we notice from our own data that there is a very strong correlation between cities that have a developed payments infrastructure um, and the number of tourists that come to that market, which is why we at Visa spend a lot of time working with governments, um, with our financial institution partners, our merchant partners, in ensuring that um, cities and travel destinations have the most um, up-to-date travel infrastructure in order to attract tourists. So that's competitiveness. The second issue is something that everybody has already raised, which is, I think, critical, is sustainability. Um, demand is surging um, all over the world, which is a great thing. But on the other hand, it really runs the risk of, of over-tourism and over-saturation. And we at Visa, you know, we use sort of our analysis of trends and consumer preferences to work with governments and our other partners, not just to help attract tourism, but to help manage tourism flows. Um, just yesterday, we uh, were part of the launch of a really exciting initiative on sustainable tourism called Travelist, which was spearheaded by um, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry. Um, and the whole point of this initiative is to promote sustainable tourism, to ensure that the communities, local communities, are benefiting from the tourists who are in their communities to ensure that tourism is done in a way that protects the environment and protects wildlife. Um, it's something we all need to be very cognizant of in, in the tourism sector, because we really are, as, as Lauren mentioned, we're reaching a bit of a tipping point. And we do need to focus our efforts very strongly on ensuring that as tourism grows, it grows in a sustainable way. Um, the third factor that we see is travelers are traveling before they even leave their homes. You know, as e-commerce is hitting about $900 billion um, in 2020, travelers are paying for their experiences, they're booking their travel, they're paying for their tickets, et cetera, before they even leave. And from a payments perspective, it just underscores the need to ensure that cross-border payments are done in the most safe and secure way. And that's a huge value that we bring to the table through, um, you know, what the work that we do on preventing fraud and securing payments, et cetera. Likewise, the fourth trend is when travelers travel, they're very nervous about losing their cash. When we surveyed travelers, 45% indicated that their, their primary concern was theft of cash and loss of cash on the ground. And that's where, again, digital payments play a really important role 
because as a consumer, as a traveler going to the Seychelles, I know that I can use the very same uh, payment credential that I use in my house um, to book my travel, to pay for travel um, on the ground in the Seychelles, in Botswana, in South Africa, or where, wherever. So I guess the moral of the story is there's a lot going on in the travel and tourism space. Um, there are a lot of pressing um, concerns in the area of sustainability, and this is why fora like this where stakeholders from the government, um, from the private sector, and from trade associations can really work together to establish best practices so that as we look at travel and tourism going forward, we look at it growing, but we also looking at it growing in a very sustainable uh, fashion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we, have, uh, we have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. Uh, there's, a, there's a microphone over here. Um, are, there any, are there any questions? Perhaps you need to think for a little bit. Um, I mean, we, we can also um, uh, go to any, um, any, any further remarks if there's anything, uh, anything you feel you'd, you'd like to add. Yeah, I'd just like to add that um, in the run-up to the UN General Assembly, um, where the focus is going to be on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we've just um, uh, commissioned a study to look at how to map aviation's contribution to the Sustainable Aviation Goals. As you know, you know at the moment, you know, there's a lot of focus on the environment um, aspect of things, mm -hmm. but aviation contributes significantly to 15 out of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, take zero hunger take humanitarian aid, take uh, poverty alleviation, take gender equality. Across all of these elements, aviation is doing a, a significant job. Um, and so we're trying to bring this to, to the fore so that, again, we can ensure that we enable the environment for sustainable growth of that industry so that it can deliver on its promise of being a driver of social and economic change. Thank you. Yeah, there's one thing also that I, we put a lot of emphasis on, and which I saw in the report, was that when you compare the different regions, Africa had the lowest um, intake or in receipt per visitor, which was about 660, compared to America, which was about 1,600 uh, USD per visitor. And in Seychelles, we put a lot of emphasis on the receipt that we get per um, visitor instead of looking at the, the the total number of visitors you know because um, sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on the numbers um, of visitors that come without looking at the receipt and receipt per visitor and and uh, the, the main um, um, trust of the whole idea is that you need to be able to enable um, each visitor that comes into the country to spend you need to entice them to spend as much as possible while they are there and also to stay longer. So if they spend about 10 days or 14 days and for each day they spend a certain amount of money, you don't need to have huge numbers of visitors coming in because each visitor that do comes spend enough money into the economy that, um, that, uh, that is enough instead of keep on increasing the numbers. And I think that's something that is partly mentioned in the report but for us, especially because I come from a small island where we have only 95,000 people, so we cannot keep on increasing the numbers into huge numbers, into millions of people. So, so we, we have to look at other dimensions and other figures that are more important rather than the total number that comes into the country. Demetrios? I, I mean, I think the only other sort of piece of insight is going back to what I said earlier. Um, is there's a very strong correlation between um, the number of tourists and the, and the ability of tourists to actually spend in the way that the minister said um, with the um, availability of the infrastructure to be able to accept payments. Um, and that's an area where we spend quite a bit of time working with, with governments to ensure that as they're working on strategies to attract tourism, they're doing so um, in a way that also modernizes the infrastructure to, to enable tourists to be able to feel as comfortable as they can spending as much as they can um, in that market. Thank you. And Lauren? Yeah, sure. Um, I think touching on what all of you have said, the, that tipping point is not just a case of whether infrastructure and carrying capacity can, can contain the, the emerging growth, but also 
is it going to destroy the very assets that, mm. that tourism depends on? Are our oceans safe? Are our mountains safe? Are our cultural and heritage assets at risk of being destroyed? And so really with, with emerging um, region, you know, nascent tourism regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, like South America, we really have the opportunity to change what we want out of people visiting us. Right. And so really looking at how much we want them to spend, do we want to mimic mass tourism or can we actually make a choice to rather attract visitors that care about sustainability, that make choices that are conscious about sustainable development goals, is a real opportunity where if you're not a mature market, that you can, you can divert that maybe a little bit easier than some of those more established mature economies mm -hmm. who have patterns that they're entrenched in. And so there's, there's a challenge for both mature and emerging economies in travel and tourism, but there's, as I said earlier, really some opportunity where, where we're not stuck in patterns that, have, um, that take us on the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll close there. Thank you.